Does serenity smell like a rose? A rose is kind-hearted. A rose is consoling. The rose is the empress of the pinks. Perhaps a rose is the empress of the blues. When Bessie Smith sang about not being able to live in a house that was falling down, that's how I felt about my old life. It is also the song that James Baldwin listened to one winter in the mountains of Switzerland, where, far away from Harlem, he wrote, Nobody Knows My Name. Actually, I had no idea what serenity felt like. Serenity is supposed to be one of the main characters in old-fashioned femininity's cultural personality. She is serene, and she endures. Yes, she is so talented at enduring and suffering, they might even be the main characters in her story. It was time to find new main characters with other talents. No one was more surprised than, than I was to begin the um, Living Autobiography trilogy. I write fiction, I cut my writing teeth on theatre. I had a theatre training, um, not to be an actor, but to be a playwright. And so from 23 to, to 25, um, I'd written plays. And then I made that transition to prose with my first novel, Beautiful Mutants. By the time I got to the living autobiography, um, <clears throat> I think the beginning was, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a request to write an essay uh, in response to the British political writer George Orwell's essay published in 1946, Why I Write. And Orwell had taken, um, he had, had four headings that I think stand today. Rather strange language, but, but I, I, think they, I think they're good. Political purpose, historical impulse, aesthetic enthusiasm, sheer egoism. And I thought, why not give those headings, why don't I steal them? and give those headings a spin from, um, from my point of view, from a female writer's point of view. And I didn't expect them to deliver to me such confronting material, um, uh, such strange material for myself to be writing. So in things I don't want to know, I put up on the screen political purpose and I find myself writing that spring when life was very hard and I was at war with my lot and couldn't see where to get to. I cried most on escalators at railway stations. So I think, well, how's this political purpose? Is this even all right? Who is this I? This, this, this first person, who is this narrator who's very like myself? But I was on to something that began to fascinate me. Um, and so in a way, I had to work against my own um, editorial instincts because in fiction, you have characters who are your avatars, who can speak for you. So, so as a child, you know, that was one of the great um, pleasures of, um, of writing stories. Someone else could speak for me. So the challenge of finding um, a tone, a voice that could steer the autobiographies, the living autobiographies, um, I think that by the time I finished number one, Things That I Want to Know, I'd found that voice. That was very important to me. And it's hard to explain this, even to myself. Because um, I needed to find a voice that wasn't grander than I am, that wasn't a better person than I am. And I also needed to find a voice that wasn't more modest than I am or more 
or, or I didn't want to find a voice that made me smaller than I am to make readers like me. Because that's very tempting. You can find, it's a, it's a female strategy. You can find all sorts of flaws and faults and put them out there. And I thought, no, I don't want to go that way either. Then I wanted a voice that was um, how we all are. Immensely powerful and immensely fragile. Maybe on Monday one and on Thursday the other. And that these could coexist. So these sound like um, pretty basic things, but actually, um, for a female writer, I think that's confronting. I'm not sure a male writer would have to consider those things. Um, <clears throat> so the struggle not to make myself weaker than I actually am that was, it was very tempting to do that, and the struggle not to make myself uh, sort of stronger than I am. I resisted that, and I sort of found, found, found the voice that would steer the, the books. So in a way, it was those tears that started the living autobiography, these mysterious tears, just going up the escalators at, a, at an always train station. Um, <clears throat> I think that stands, um, going from the, the unconscious and sort of journeying up. It didn't feel like that at the time. It felt like a thriller. What's going on? You know? And I was going to have to be both the weeper and the detective at, at, at the same time. Like, what is actually happening? And I began to research the, the history, the technology of escalators. And um, they were called magic stairways in their first invention. And in America, endless conveyors. And that interested me so much because something was being conveyed to me, the narrator, on that journey up. And um, in the, in the first book, it, there are many things going on. Um, if I wasn't thinking of the past, my childhood in South Africa, it was thinking about me. And the, the escalators somehow, um, somehow encouraged this, this conversation. And I began it in the, in the first book. So I like as a writer, to, um, I don't really like theory. I read a lot of theory. I don't like theory <clears throat> or psychoanalytic theory to stamp its muddy boots all over the pages of my work. I, I, I want, I, I, I want the, the work to, um, the, to appear, to be light on its feet. With a, with a bit like swimming, with a, a current, a, a, an undertow. You know, that could carry you out to the wild sea. <clears throat> so I like to find an object or an action, like, like the escalator, something real, something from life, you know, um, to somehow carry my arguments. That's what I like as a writer and a reader. What's the point of writing about stuff you understand? You know, um, there's nothing to do. So it is true that I set myself um, sometimes really preposterous challenges. In my novel, Hot Milk, I wanted to write a thriller about hypochondria. How, is hyper how can hypochondria really be interesting for too long? But then I reckoned that every family has one or we are one that we are kind of interested in how the body speaks for us. And that is, of course, Freud's project, too. Um, so I did, a, I did a dramatization for the BBC of Dora and, and of the Wolfman. And Freud was played by a very good actor called Robert Glenister. And he, at the time, um, mostly play, played cops on TV dramas, and uh, 
we had a chat, you know, before we went into rehearsal. And I said, no, the thing is, you have to encourage Dora, who is 17, to speak. And so if you're a cop and you want to get her, she's going to, shut, she's going to close up. Because he asked me a very interesting question. When I, um, Freud would, would listen, and he'd say, I see. Well, what does he see? This is Robert's question. And I say, well, you want to encourage the excavation, the, a, a sort of archaeology of, 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 new, of new memories, of, of new thoughts, of thought streams. So the avant-garde science of um, early psychoanalysis is very interesting to me. Uh, thought streams, um, the, the way that Freud um, described repression is, um, it, we, think, we think we understand that, or I think I understand it. But as I begin to apply it as a writer, not as Freud would have obviously uh, applied, thank goodness, um, you sort of begin to understand that, in a way, all writing is this excavation, is this um, bringing to the surface. The conceal and the reveal is, is, is in, in any genre is going to be my game. And often what's concealed is so much more interesting than what's revealed. Um, and it's not easy to do, not in something called a living autobiography, um, living because it's written pretty much in the present tense. It's not, doesn't start with childhood, the move chronologically, you know, looking over your shoulder at the past. Um, it's not written. Um, it's not written with hindsight. It's not my favorite sight, actually, hindsight. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's written, it's not written to be wise. You know, it's, 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 it's written, it, it confronts, it confronts life in the present tense. You know, all of Virginia Woolf's essays really have that eye, either overtly or, or sort of buried in it. And the eye is a we as well, because, you know, you are speaking to, to, to someone. I have, you know, we, I have arguments to chase. I don't want to be cute about it this, the arguments to chase, to, 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 to haul home, a lot of watching and listening. So in the shed uh, that I wrote in at this time, under the apple tree, um, there were different seasons. So I moved in when it was snowing, very cold. Um, the summer, it's like a sauna, very hot. And then the best month for, for, for a writing shed is the, is the autumn, the fall. Um, and there was an apple tree that uh, grew above the roof of the shed. And the apples used to fall on, onto the shed like an explosion, so, so loud. And I began to understand as I as I watched these apples fall, um, how Newton got he got his got, got relativity. You know, it, it, he he got he, you watch something for enough time, and something sort of changes in your perception. So, the the shed taught me to be slow, to be a slow thinker. Um, I like fast thinkers. It taught me to be a slower thinker, to watch, to observe. And I noticed the way when squirrels go up the tree and they suddenly look at you. They've looked at you before they've looked at you to check that you're not a predator, that you're not going to harm them. And that was so interesting to me. They knew I was there before they kind of told me 
that they were there with the gays. All that I, 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 I um, built into the book. And when I came out of the shed, uh, always a ritual. I put a, a, a sort of sheet over my, lap, my desktop, uh, windows closed, um, take my coffee cups, um, lock the door, and out into life, into the fresh air, in all the weathers. Um, and I think your question is really, so you're writing about life and you're walking into life, but this is a sort of heightened life in the, in the living autobiographies. And the tempo of actual life was, is, is, is very different. So actually the living autobiographies are a kind of mashup of travel writing, of philosophy, of everyday life. Um, they, were, they were a genre that began to evolve as I, as I wrote it. So they're quite, a they're quite a hybrid form anyway. If you have painful, if you have painful thoughts, if you're in a painful situation, um, it's you, you don't want to think slowly. That is to linger. Uh, uh, Michel Welbeck has a very good uh, definition of poetry. Uh, I saw an interview um, in which he's asked, "What is poetry?" And I'm paraphrasing. This isn't exactly correct, but he says. You find the wound, and you put your finger on it, and you press. That very, that that was a very kind of evocative um, description of one kind of writing. Slow thinking means that you have to, you you have to linger on the minute eye, something of of something that um, you'd rather not think about. Um, and then, you know, to be more upbeat, something that seemed very amusing. I think, why was that? Why did that make me smile so much? And then you dig and you discover that actually it goes right back from uh, 2017, maybe, when I was writing one of these, to, to 1983. Ah, you can find links and connections. So slow thinking is important in a very fast, wired world. Um, I, I really, I really appreciate it when somebody thinks very deeply for me. That's a gift to me. You, it, it, it isn't really just drifting thought streams. You know, I am a nerdy writer. So I'm wanting to shape and sculpt and find literary techniques to keep it moving, to keep, um, to keep readers on the bus, to keep me on the bus, uh, which is, you know, a, a, an expression that we use to, we don't, you, we don't want you to get off the bus before the end. <laughs> Although we often, we often do get off as fast as possible. Um, no. Uh, but where you're right is that 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 interconnectedness of of thinking will move around all time zones, and that is a theme that I explore in my novel, The Man Who Saw Everything. Um, you know, so how how we work with time as writers is the is the challenge. Um, I've just finished my next novel. It's called August Blue. And um, and I, I discovered, oh, this is going to be set over one year, August, I don't know, September through to August the next year. And I thought, really? Why is that? And, I, and as, I, as, as I write, I began, begin to understand why that is. Um, but how can life not be um, in, interconnected? And it's very, it's very exhilarating. Um, I think we, we're not so much shrinks as film directors. We have to 
cast our books, we have to dress our avatars, we have to light the scene, we have to decide, it, do you, how many lines do you have? Are you a minor character or a major character? When I was writing Swimming Home, I had a very funny exchange that I, with myself that, I still, that still makes me laugh. Um, I had a minor character in Swimming Home and literally one day I'm just like writing him to exit sort of thing. And he says, no, no, I want more lines. I'm not a minor character. I'm a much more major character than you think I am. And I said, how so? And you know, this is this strange sh shamanistic dialogue you have with yourself. I thought, okay, mm, I'll give you another scene. And it was so important, that scene. Um, but that's always interesting. Uh, the major characters in our lives are always the most trouble. And the minor characters um, are very important. Sometimes they haunt us, don't they? They could become a bit more major, but somehow, but somehow we keep them minor. Um, so these are, the, these are the sort of preoccupations of, of my nerdy writing life. What do you mean when you say that? Do I... Does it matter? One. Two. Um, when... Okay, let's say it means X. We don't want to reveal it here. We'll reveal it 25 pages on. So then how are you going to keep the reader connected through that journey? All of that stuff is, is, is a writing life, as much about architecture, as much about stamina, and as, as much as about, as about just actually really having the energy to haul this work home. Um, I really think it's as much about stamina as inspiration. Maybe as one gets older, the world has more dimensions, not less, just so many more. And they come, they, they come into play because you, 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 you have more experience with which to process uh, uh, the world that, that you're living in and the world that is constantly surprising you. I mean, oh, um, you know, we, we are writing at, a, at this moment in time when the world is on fire, um, where in a way content isn't the problem. There's so much of it. So let's just take some of it and really go in deep. I'm sort of going for some of those tropes, uh, vintage tropes, really. Serenity, endurance, suffering. Um, I give that, that an airing. Um, well, um, I play around with it. I say, are these talents? <laughs> Is endurance? You know, I I will endure. Is that a talent? I say, well, okay. If it is, then we find another talent. Um, so, so the language that I use to describe um, those things is different. In The Cost of Living, I have, um, I refer to the corridors of love. And the corridors of love are the corridors of a new apartment block um, that I've moved into with my children. And the, it, the building is being restored and these uh, corridors and are in a state of disrepair and they reflect the disrepair in myself at this time my marriage is over I'm making a new life and so my joke is that these are the corridors of love they're in need of restoration and um, as I began to tour with with the cost of living around the world and um, I think uh, qu quite a few times in Ireland um, one woman, uh, she was about 70, and she put up her hand and she said, Deborah, have the corridors of love been restored? And I was so pleased that she had accepted my language. 
Because, you know, the corridors of love, this, this, this is not everyday language. Right. But she had absolutely accepted my language. She got it. And, um, and I said, no. They'd restored the, the, the lobby, the, the, uh, but in fact, the corridors of love still needed some, some um, repair. And she said, oh. And then I laughed and I said, I've never been asked an interior decoration question before. And she laughed. So every writer finds a language. And um, I, 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 felt very, I felt very moved that, that, that some of the, the, the stranger poetic language for hard, everyday problems, had sort of worked, had, had, had become a, the language to talk about the books with, too. That was great. I think that if we wrote our lives as we feel them, we would never write anything boring. How could it be boring? It's easier said than done. So if you were to take Wednesday and really write it as you feel it, it would become political, it would become historical, it would be emotionally quite volatile in parts. Um, everyday actions, like slamming a door, um, being rude to someone in a shop, you would give that, that an airing. Um, and I've said this many times, but um, my generation of writer was sort of told that women do all the feeling and men do all the thinking. So I protested at that from the off, from the moment I became a writer. That was never going to be the way. And now I find myself saying, okay, um, if you can access uh, your feelings, if you can, because most of us can't, we put a lot of our attention and energy into not feeling. Quite right, we have to get through life. Um, so if you write from that position, you, you're not going to write anything boring. And what is boring, actually, to me, at this time, and, and remember for the living autobiographies, they stand on the shoulders of so many writers, of James Baldwin, of, of Virginia Woolf, actually of Hans Christian Andersen, because, because the unconscious goes all the way through those, those, those um, fairy stories that um, were of such interest to me. Um, they stand on the shoulders of all kinds of music. Um, John Cage. So we can, we, 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 we can go to my avant-garde family, the Surrealists. Um, and to a hardline, very clear political writer like Orwell, who started the, the whole thing. Um, to, to a philosopher like Montaigne, who, who, who wrote the eye, uh, the male eye, into his work so, so wonderfully. Uh, but the, the writing that really bores me is where um, there is no emotion, although, as you know, I write quite sternly, quite, quite, quite sparsely, I'm a modernist, but where there is no emotion and where there, this, there seems to be this entitlement to stride through the world with no vulnerability except for the vulnerability of others. That I'm not interested in. And I think that's probably because I've written three, these three books. Okay, I'm going to go. I'm quoting now. Um, Marguerite Duras 
from her book Practicalities, and she's, she's writing about mothers and childhood, and this is Duras. I believe that always, or almost always, in all childhoods and in all the lives that follow them, the mother represents madness. Our mothers always remain the strangest, craziest people we've ever met. And so this had me thinking of my own mother. Um, She takes up quite a lot of the cost of living. And my question to myself in regard to to, to my mother is this. Did I mock the dreamer in my mother and then insult her for having no dreams? What do we need dreamy mothers for? We do not want mothers who gaze beyond us, longing to be elsewhere. We need her to be of this world, lively, capable, entirely present to our needs. There is a photograph I have kept of my mother in her late 20s. She is sitting on a rock at a picnic with friends. Her hair is wet because she's had a swim. There is a kind of introspection in her expression that I now relate to the very best of her. I can see that she is close to herself in this moment.